Alas. Well, a new expose on Haiti shows how business owners and members of the country's elite used Haiti's police force as their own private army, giving them guns and ammunition after the 2004 U.S.-backed coup that ousted President Jean Bertrand Aristide. It's part of a series of reports that draw from almost 2,000 U.S. diplomatic cables on Haiti released by WikiLeaks. The series is a partnership between The Nation magazine and the Haitian weekly newspaper AT Liberté. Uh, the cables cover an almost seven-year period from April 2003 to February 2010, just after the earthquake that devastated the capital of Port-au-Prince and surrounding cities. Another recent expose details how the United States, the European Union and the United Nations supported Haiti's recent presidential and parliamentary elections, despite concerns that the country had unfairly excluded Haiti. Haiti's largest opposition party, uh, Lavalas, the party of Aristide. And a third report in the series explains how contractors for Fruit of the Loom, Haynes and Levi's worked with the U.S. Embassy to aggressively block a minimum wage increase for Haitian assembly zone workers, the lowest paid workers in the hemisphere, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. We're joined now by the two authors of these reports, veteran Haiti correspondent Dan Coughlin and Haiti Liberté editor Kim Ives. Dan covered Haiti for the Interpress Service from the United Nations and Port-au-Prince between 92 and 96, currently executive director of Manhattan Neighborhood Network, MNN, and writes for The Nation magazine. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Kim, why don't you start off um, just outlining the latest revelations that you've gotten from these WikiLeaks documents and what these documents are, the U.S. government cables. Yeah, well, uh, the U.S. government cables are uh, part of the 250,000 uh, confidential and secret cables that WikiLeaks got from the um, uh, diplomatic service from the State Department. Um, essentially, since we were on last talking about Petro Caribe, we've had uh, four st major stories, which are that they were blocking the hiking of the minimum wage from five dollar uh, from a buck seventy five a day to five dollars. They wanted three dollars, and that's what they won, uh, working with uh, Haitian assembly industry owners. Um, they who, was, who was trying to raise the, the minimum wage? There was the people. There were there were there was a movement uh, on the ground of uh, students, workers, uh, and the general public, which wanted to see it go up. And uh, who was blocking? Uh, that was the assembly industry owners and the U.S. Uh, working with them. The the. the Two of them worked together to uh, basically bring in Praval to stop it and, and set it down to three bucks a day. Uh, so that was one. At the same time, they were going into um, an election uh, which was uh, clearly flawed. They knew it and they had a meeting and they said, okay. This is the, the U.S. The, yeah, the U.S. along with the <laughs> EU. UN and a number of other so-called friends of Haiti uh, sat down and said, okay, we're going to fund this election, even though uh, we know from the start that it's uh, flawed. And um, they had a meeting and said, okay, we're going to rubber stamp and pay for it, uh, even though we know it's, it's flawed. Um, and at the same time saying that they were going to pay for the right-wing opposition, the National Endowment for Democracy funded opposition by buying them radio time and so forth. Uh, we also had a story last week that was by Ansel Hertz uh, about um, the way the U.S. came in with their military uh, right after the, the earthquake and with no clearance from Praval decided to bring in 22,000 troops uh, when the people needed uh, 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 doctors and engineers and so forth. Here were soldiers patrolling the street and blocking the hospital, as we saw, Amy. Uh, and um, finally, this week, we, we have the uh, question of the, the uh, bourgeoisie turning the police into their own private army. And, and what these cables show, Amy, it's really remarkable. It's like uh, the curtain being pulled from behind the Wizard of Oz. Really inside look at what, it, what the U.S. policy is in Haiti, the materially poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So they're blocking a preferential trade deal with Venezuela that means huge uh, stability for the Haitian country, uh, for the Haitian people, uh, stable electricity supply, $100 million in extra funding for the government, which they use for uh, uh, social programs. We see the manipulation, extraordinary manipulation of Haiti's presidential election where, quote unquote, 
the international community recognizes that the opposition is emasculated. So why are we bothering to have an election if the most popular political party has been banned? And you see in these cables, uh, the Canadians and others are like a little concerned. Hey, how are we, we going to have an election here? And literally, the head of the, the EU in Haiti, the head of the UN, the head of uh, the Spanish ambassador, the Brazilian ambassador, the U.S. ambassador, at a meeting, at a table, discussing this. And finally, they decide, oh, uh, we have too much invested in Haiti not to let these fraudulent it's elections like move forward. It's like the Republicans have the Democrats banned in the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Democracy Now! went with Jean-Bertrand Aristide, uh, returned with him from South Africa, where he was in exile for seven years, uh, to Haiti. We were on the plane uh, when he returned. At the airport, when we landed, he was greeted by thousands of supporters. He addressed the crowd in several languages. When he spoke in English, he said, exclusion is the problem, inclusion is the solution, not directly referencing his party, Fami Lavalas, which was excluded from the election. But when he addressed the Haitians in Creole, in their language, he was much more explicit. You are right. If we don't salvage our dignity, our dignity will be gone. Yes, you are right, because the problem is exclusion, and the solution is inclusion. The exclusion of Fami Lavalas is the exclusion of the majority. The exclusion of the majority means that you are cutting off exactly the branch that we are all sitting on. The problem is exclusion. The solution is inclusion of all Haitians without discrimination, because everybody is a person. That was President Jean-Bertrand Aristide, March 18th, just a few months ago, on the tarmac at the airport in Port-au-Prince, addressing that his party, the main party, was excluded from the election. And you're saying the documents show the U.S. Uh, said we've got to—they recognized it was a massive problem, but they said they were going to push it through. Yeah, election. absolutely. Not only uh, were they going to push it through, they were even considering then—they even discussed a plan to actually help some of the— uh, right-wing opposition parties to get on the air, uh, to, to put them on the Haitian media in order to try to, uh, what they considered, balance the playing field, though, in fact, the largest political party would still be barred. But they were out there trying to, to, uh, to uh, actually intervene in the uh, Haitian uh, sovereign election process. And, of course, in the cables, it shows they don't care. It's not an issue for anybody that, oh, they're intervening in a, in a local election and uh, on the side of some parties against the other. They're just interested in pushing through their candidate. And that's what really comes out in it, was that you see, for the Lavalas family, they felt more that they that would look bad. But for the other ones, they were really concerned that they fare well, that they'd been emasculated, that they were somehow uh, 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 disadvantaged, even though they're the ones that get millions of dollars through the National Democratic Institute and in the International Republican Institute, these two tentacles of the uh, NED that go into Haiti. Uh, Dan, I'm wondering if you could uh, uh, be a little more specific in terms of this attempt to block the trade uh, deal with Venezuela, that specifically what the cables, some of them said in, in terms of reporting. I guess they were reporting back to Washington what, what was going on. Yeah, and you could see that sp uh, specific detail on HaitiLiberté.com's website and on the Nation.com as well. But uh, what happened is uh, Chevron and ExxonMobil, amongst other oil companies, in conjunction with the U.S. Embassy, uh, tried to block this deal by putting enormous pressure on President Preval to stop the oil from coming in and the deal with Chavez to happen. And, in fact, when Preval visited President Bush in the White House, this was a main issue of conversation, was Haiti's relationship with Venezuela, Haiti's attempt to get Hate, uh, energy independence. And so you see how they maneuver, what strings they pull, how they're constantly applying pressure on Haiti, whether it's to, to keep the minimum wage low, to stop energy independence, to uh, have their people win the election. And we, also, we also see it in the case of the uh, gold rush. That's the words of uh, Ambassador Kenneth Merton that came after the, the US earthquake. Ambassador. The U.S. ambassador said there's a gold rush right now because the gold was all these billions of dollars going to Haiti, and our contractors, U.S. contractors, are going to get it. So you had people like General Wesley Clark going down and fronting for a company called Innovita, which put up these apparently completely worthless uh, foam core uh, construction houses. Um, supposedly donating thousands, but 
uh, and another company called Ashbrit, based out of uh, Pompano Beach, which were all going down basically to get a part of the, the booty, uh, this disaster capitalism run amok. Uh, so we see, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. basically rubbing their hands along with these people. Talk, Dan, about the U.S. corporations and the minimum wage. Well, Name the corporations and wh what were they doing with the United States? Well, Haiti was the original runaway shop back in the 70s when American companies trying to flee U.S. workers, U.S. unions moved to Haiti. If you remember, it was famous for baseball production back in the 70s. So it's always been an offshore, tax free, low wage. Uh, no worker, minimal worker rights, minimal environmental regulations in Haiti. It's just a free trade zone. So it's been developed like that intermittently over the last 40 years. But Haitians object to this because they're mistreated, poorly paid, uh, and so there's a lot of resistance to it. But companies like Haynes, Fruit of the Loom, uh, Levi Strauss, uh, these are named in the cables who use these contractors to make manufacture undergarments, T-shirts in Haiti itself is a very low-waged center, in fact, the lowest-wage center in the hemisphere, and it's acknowledged as such the poorest paid, the lowest paid workers in the hemisphere. These assembly zone contractors who have these contracts with Haynes and Fruit of the Loom are putting enormous pressure with the U.S. Embassy uh, on the Haitian parliament not to increase the minimum wage, uh, because they claim that this will, you know, devastate the industry. This is the same uh, argument that they've used time and time again. But these are the poorest paid workers in the hemisphere. They can hardly eat. I think a third of the population of Haiti re it requires some food assistance. And Amy, this uh, bourgeoisie that is carrying this out is the same one that is behind uh, the coups that are happening in Haiti, that um, back the coup. We're going to have a piece uh, shortly showing uh, through the cables exactly how much they were behind the coup. And they're also the ones who are turning the uh, Haitian police into a private. Well, I was going to ask about yeah. that. Yeah, you, you mentioned specifically uh, Fritz Mevs, uh, the sign of one of the richest families right. in Haiti, admitting essentially how they were uh, uh, how they were supplying guns uh, to the police force in, in exchange for uh, for them defending them. Yeah, essentially what they had done, they had bought off one of the uh, popular leaders of uh, Cité Soleil, uh, and he'd actually been killed by uh, essentially other groups in Cité Soleil who saw that he was turned coat and defending the coup and defending the occupation and, and the bourgeoisie's um, property. And so uh, uh, when he was knocked out, the bourgeoisie panicked and they, they, they said, okay, we, we're going to start to fund the police. And the UN was useless because, or not useless, but not as effective as uh, La Bagnere. Uh, and uh, so basically they, they, they backed the police and it went all the way till they carried out a tremendous massacre on uh, uh, July 6th. 2005, where dozens of people were killed, uh, including uh, Dred Will May, who'd been the leader of this uh, resistance in City Soleil to the coup and occupation.